uh, put the Bibles in the pews in front of you or in your own private Bibles. Um, we're going to be in Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 38 this morning. A uh, few Bibles are right in front of you there. Feel free to use those and stay with me in, in that text. Leave your Bibles open there as we get into God's Word together. Luke writes these Interpretation according to the law of Moses had been Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him that it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against. So the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also Phineas, Anna, the daughter of Phanel, the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had been seven years after, and a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption. Let's pray. Lord God, this text is less familiar than those that we usually read at Christmas. Lord, help us to see, see you in these words and to receive what you have for us today. Lord, as we look at these two individuals who were waiting, who were hungry for what you had for them, Lord, let us be sober and realistic as we talk today about what we are expecting and about who and how you are at work in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for this time together. We give you all the glory, all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> you know, last night, my wife and I watched Christmas Carol with uh, the Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. We saw the George C. Scott version. I like him. It's solid. I got it for Patton. Where did you see it? Huh? How are you able to see it? No, we had it on video. Yeah, um, and um, and I was you know I was reminded again we can get so caught up in looking at um, ourselves and our own stuff and being so aware of all the things that we have to do to take care of ourselves and um, it's just a good reminder of of looking outside of ourselves um, you know we have this great opportunity next Saturday to come for an hour and a half or so and serve uh, some people that really are in need that they don't have much in terms of family. Um, with this transition to living facility, and I would encourage you all to, to, um, to really pray about doing that. And there's something that, that's really neat that happens when we're able to serve others and give back to those that are in need, um, where, where God is really in that for us. And I pray that we could have um, those kind of epiphanies. So uh, may you pray about that um, intently and be encouraged um, in the possibilities that we have to love others and care for others. Okay, as we um, go forward here, I want to look about um, the things that we're expecting or, or, or looking for. 
And so I, have, I found a couple of um, letters to Santa Claus for children that I'm going to read for you, and we can go from there. Waiting, expecting, is sometimes something that is very hard for us. So we have these letters. Uh, Dear Santa Claus, when you come to my house, there will be cookies for you, but if you are real hungry, you can use our phone and order a pizza. <laughs> Dear Santa, I want a puppy. I want a playhouse. Thank you. I've been good most of the time. Sometimes I've been wild. <laughs> From a four-year-old. Dear Santa Claus, I'll take anything because I haven't been that good this year. <laughs> Dear Santa Claus, I'm not going to ask for a lot. Here's my list. The Etch-A-Sketch Animator, two packs of number two pencils, Crayola fat markers, and the big gift, my own color TV. Well, maybe you could drop the pencils. I don't want to be selfish. <laughs> good. You know, and I ask us this year, what are you waiting for? I mean, all of us in our faith, are hungry and are waiting for something, something more, something bigger, something greater. Because truly, when we're honest about our relationship with Christ, we're not content to have the status quo. We're not content to have what it's always been like. We're always yearning and hungering for more of God when He is our first priority. What are you looking for from God this Christmas? In the Gospel of Luke, we come across two characters who make their appearance in really the last act of the Christmas story. One is a man named Simeon. The other is a woman named Anna. They don't seem truly important in the culture, yet their accounts with the Savior speak incredible things to us. Both of them are waiting for something. They are waiting for someone. Luke uses the Greek word of anticipation that identifies them as waiting with expectation for the coming of the Messiah. They were literally alert to his appearance, ready to welcome him as soon as he was to come. We see Simeon here introduced in Luke 2.25. For you up here. Now there was a devout man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Simeon was righteous before people and his relationship with God was right. Isn't it? It's, it's interesting. As our relationship with God is right, we become more devout, don't we? We become more holy. We become more righteous and we begin to care about the things of God more. Isn't that funny? It all goes back to that relationship with, with, with God. When our relationship is right, all the other things fall in, into place. When He really is our first priority, the first desire of our heart. We find um, God's people are not doing so well the time that Christ is born, the nation has been taken over. It's occupied by the Romans. They don't like that. In fact, remember, they, they always pictured that the Messiah would come as a military conqueror on a stallion with an army. Verse 26 says to us, It had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Simeon wanted comfort for his situation. The comfort that Christ would bring. And among the Jews of Simeon's day, one of the popular titles of Messiah was Comforter. They saw the Messiah as being the one who would bring comfort. And it's funny, Jesus actually gives that title to the Holy Spirit from himself. Does that make sense? He's, he's listed as a comforter initially. And he gives that to the Holy Spirit who literally is with us here on earth. He is the one that provides the comfort. 
And I think this desire for comfort is a, is a universal human need. I mean, we all struggle with, with, with loneliness or rejection or, or fear or feeling unimportant. And we're told here that Christ provides that. He provides comfort. It's funny, Christmas, actually, the suicide rate goes up in our country. Do you know that? It's like people that are sad become more sad because everybody's happy. The enemy will use the celebration of the birth of Christ as a way to get people even more unhappy, more depressed, more sad, more confused. And we're reminded that Christ comes and He brings comfort. The Holy Spirit prompts Simeon to go to the temple courts at just the right time, on just the right day, to see Mary and Joseph and then Jesus. Has you had an experience with the Holy Spirit where like, you'll forget something? You know, like say I'll go, I'll go to the store and I'll forget the eggs, which I hardly ever do because I'm really organized when I go to the store. I was being sarcastic. And so I have to go back for something, and when I go back, God brings someone in my path. Have you ever had that happen? You know, and so like you're doing something, all of a sudden you, you have to, do, to run an errand or certain thing, and all of a sudden you, you come across someone, and it's like a divine appointment. You have those things. Or, or this happens, for those of us who are aware of it, we'll have, we'll have a desire or a feeling like we need to do something or go somewhere. You know? the strong urge to go and do something that the Holy Spirit is calling us to do. To go over to this thing or that thing or go over here. And whatever it is, He will move us to a place we need to be at to encounter what God wants us to find. And some of the greatest times of, of either being reunited with somebody or, or being able to care for somebody are in these divine moments. And so Simeon goes and he sees the baby Jesus about six weeks old, and he finds Emmanuel, God with us, to make everything right, to provide significance, eliminate rejection, fear, and loneliness. And it says in verse 28 that Simeon literally sees the baby and pulls him out of Mary's arms. Some of you mothers are like, mm mm. No, he did not do that. He reaches down and he pulls the promise of God in his hands. What, a, what an incredible moment that must have been to hold the promise of God in your hands. And he breaks out in praise, acknowledging all that God had done in bringing this anointed one this answer to the yearning of so many hearts. And we have this answer, this power, this love to so many of life's problems at our own fingertips now every day as Christian believers. The same comfort that Simeon longed for and found in the child of Jesus is our comfort whenever we call on His name. In Christ, we find comfort. We find peace. And God is so good that He will actually use us and others to bring that comfort to each other. You know, sometimes knowing the Lord is, is the best thing, but we want to have a person to love. <laughs> and He'll bring that comfort through friends, through fellowship, through the church, through family, whatever it be. He's the one who brings the comfort. He's the one who brings the peace. Especially when we seek it and rely on Him for it. The next one here is Anna. With anticipation. Anna is waiting for forgiveness. Her husband had died and she dedicated herself to fasting and praying at the temple every day. The Bible says that she never left the temple, worshipped all day and night. And God says to her, you're going to find this forgiveness. She's looking forward like Simeon was, with a different expectation. Not looking for comfort, looking for forgiveness. 
verse 38 says this, coming to them at that very moment, she gives thanks to God and spoke about the child, all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel, the forgiveness for the people. This idea of redemption relates to the old idea of captivity. They were in slavery in Egypt and were delivered into the promised land. But the Savior had to be more than someone who would take them to a different location. When Anna saw Jesus, she gives thanks to God and spoke of Him to all who were waiting for redemption, the one who would save the people from their sins. It's different for us today. We have forgiveness in Christ the moment that we ask. But a lot of us have a hard time forgiving ourselves. You know, we wrestle with that. We're forgiven in Christ, but yet we have a hard time forgiving ourselves. And when the enemy is aware of that, he will do all that he can to get us to fall back into our sin or back into our former way of life. You know, he likes nothing more than for us to, to overcome whatever the issue is, whatever the addiction or the hardship or that thing that is not of God. Then he will come back to us when we're free from it. He'll say, remember how great that was? Remember how great, remember how great life was back then when we had that thing? I mean, yeah, sure, you had all these problems, but life was great. Life of the world. Woo! And we buy into that. You know what I mean? We wrestle with it. We say, we say gee, you know, maybe he was right, you know? Maybe that was better. Maybe life was more fun. And, and all of a sudden, we can begin to lose sight of our forgiveness and our new reality as a new creation in Christ. And we're reminded over and over and over again, we are forgiven fully and completely by Jesus. Completely, our sins are washed away. Completely redeemed in Christ. And the truth that we have here is that Jesus provides what we need. He's a God of comfort. He's a God of forgiveness. He's also the God of everything else. For Him, there is nothing that is impossible. We're reminded of this over and over and over again in the Scriptures. Anything is possible with Him. Anything is possible. And we can spend all so much of our time and our money going to other places to find that which only Christ can heal in our lives. To find that which only Christ can, can, can answer. I, mean, I, I know of, of people who have spent lots of money trying to find answers to happiness because we're all created for relationship with God the Father. But we can fill that void with a lot of other things. And in fact, every person that you know has filled the void that we have inside of us for God with something. Every non-believing friend, every person has got something that is the first place in their life if they don't have Christ. Every person. I mean, just before, I've got a friend who's a, a sports enthusiast, and he records all of his uh, baseball teams' games. They play 162 baseball games a year. And he records all of the game and watches every inning. Not a believer. We worship something. It's a lot of, that's a lot of baseball. Whatever it is, every one of us is created with a place for God, and we put something there if God is not in that place. So, I see for us some action steps that we can take to having the reality of Christ be more a part of our lives. The first one is this, we can become a marveler. We can become a marveler of Christ. When Joseph and Mary try to process everything that is happening, verse 33 says they marveled at what was said about Jesus. Mar to, be, to marvel means to be filled with wonder, astonishment, and surprise. We can be filled with wonder because He is the Savior who can do anything. We can marvel at who He is. We can be astonished by Him. He can fill our thoughts and our minds. We can talk about Him. You're not going to believe what He did for me today. They did. 
Every once in a while I hear this, I hear Christians talking about things that God's doing in their lives. And it seems kind of weird. Because oftentimes we have God time in church, and then we go out, and it's just, you know, it's, it's this box of our day. But sometimes God is bigger than that, and he goes out into our lives outside of the church. We talk about him at lunch meetings. We talk about him with our friends. We talk about him with our families. You're not going to believe what God did in my life. Marvel at the power and the love of God. Two, we can become a mover. To become a mover, verse 27 says, Moved by the Spirit, uh, Simeon went into the temple courts. Coming up at that very moment, verse 38, she gave thanks to God. We can feel that urge from God and we can engage. We can have that opportunity and we can engage in doing the things of God. When the Holy Spirit prompted them, they didn't stand still. Look at the shepherds. They had this encounter of the angels. They could have sat up there on the mountaintop and said, that was neat. I'm good. Or coming face to face with that truth, they, they could go down and find this one that had been told to them and have their lives changed forever. Imagine the, the wise men in the, far, in, the, in the Far East saying, a king is born that we've got to go and find. They don't sit there and think about it or debate. They load their camels and head off. We can become a mover, someone who is serious about the goodness of God. Simeon doesn't come to them saying, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, here's a candy cane. He comes and he finds his Savior and says, this is the answer to my heart's desire. He's worth engaging for. I found this, I think this is true, Christmas splits people into two camps. Since Jesus has entered the world, he has divided the human race. He will cause the falling and rising of many, says Simeon. Because of who Jesus is and what he came to do, he forces people to make a decision. Jesus forces people to make a decision about him. The Bible uses powerful imagery. Jesus is, Jesus is either the rock that your life is built upon, or he's your stumbling block. He's the cornerstone of your foundation, or he is the reason that you fall over and over again. Jesus is calling each of us to a moral decision based upon our willingness to move and respond, we either rise or fall. We cannot be neutral about him. We either are for him or we're against him. We move closer towards him or we move farther away. We either have the Son or we don't. You know, the power of God is a very interesting thing. It's a very divisive reality. First of all, it ends all arguments. You ever see folks argue about if God can do something or not, and then he does it? There's no more argument. Is God able to heal somebody? They get prayed for, they get healed. You can't argue about it because it just happened. The power of God divides people. There was a, there was a guy, um, a friend of mine that I, that I know, he was a, a, an undergrad student at Penn State University, and um, he, had a, he was praying one time, and God told him to go and pray for a guy who had a foot injury in their student center. Yeah, but there's a, a fancy name for it. Anyway, so, so, so he goes over there, and sure enough, the guy that God told him in the, in the, in, in the prayer was there, and he goes up to the guy, and the guy's got his, his, uh, his ankle and his foot are heavily wrapped. He's, he's, uh, he's uh, damaged his foot and his ankle. He can't walk on it. And so, he, and so the guy goes in, he finds the guy, he says, okay, God, I believe what you said is right. And he says in the middle of the student union, who wants to see a miracle? Can you imagine Pretty cool, right? He says, who wants to see a miracle? About 30 people gather around this guy with the, with the busted uh, ankle and foot that's heavily wrapped and the crutches are there. And he says, okay, everyone. God wants to heal this man's ankle today. And he prays over him. He says, Lord, heal this ankle for your glory in Jesus' name. May this, may this injury be no more. 
May the ligaments and the tissues be fully healed in Jesus' name. Amen. And he asks the man if he feels anything. The guy says, yeah, I, I do actually. He says, why don't you stand up for us? The guy stands up. They unwrap it. starts walking around. Half the group leaves the people. See the power of God. And they're like, thanks, but no thanks. It's scary. It changes a lot when it comes to our perception of, of, of what we've got in our box of who God can be and what God can do. I think in our own human nature, especially in the Western world, it's hard to trust that God can do these things. So he says that half the people leave, the other half, actually a little less than half, turns to him and says, what the heck just happened? We want to know this kind of power. So Jesus forces a decision. Not every person wants to have him as primary. Not every person wants to know all the power, all the goodness, all the love that is available in Christ. Because truly, walking with Christ also means surrendering. You know, we can't have it all our way. It's, it's receiving what he wants and making that what we want. And then we can't come to him and say, okay, Jesus, you can be life, you can be, you can be Lord of this part of my life, but the rest of it's mine. It doesn't work that way. He doesn't work that way. Either he's first and we're moving closer towards him, or he's not and we're moving farther away. And he's so patient. I can't tell you how many people will come in and they'll say, you know, I'm so mad, God's not doing this or that, and, and, and they've got issues in their own lives, and they're, they're not willing to surrender, and all of a sudden they surrender him, and God shows up, and, they, and they, things get better, and they say, oh my gosh, for so long I held on to all my own stuff. But he doesn't push, he's not mean about it, he's not rude, he just waits for us. Revelation tells us, I stand at the door at knock. Whoever will, whoever will open the door will come in and sup with me. And the third one here, we can become a messenger. Verse 38, Anna gives thanks and goes out and spoke about the child to all who are looking forward to the redemption of Israel. The best way to be a messenger of the truth of Christ is how we live. We talked about this in the past, sir, in the past service. Uh, this was Howard, our, our dear friend who passed away. He lived what life with Christ looked like. He was generous, quick to forgive, didn't keep track of wrongs, wasn't trying to get what he deserved from others, didn't come into meetings and say, I've been here for X amount of years, look how important I am, listen to me. He came in and served and loved and, and was generous with, his, with people that he knew, with his family, and it bore witness to the reality of the Savior in his life. That's the best way we can become a messenger here on earth, is in how we live, in how we love well, and how we trust God with our decisions. Become a messenger for the Lord. Marvelers, movers, and messengers. As we can live these things out, we can't help but experience the power, the reality of Christ. There's nothing sadder for me than a believer in Christ who doesn't know the goodness and the power that he provides. Because we're talking about an empty gospel if that's the case. I mean, the Word of God is so full of all the things of God, the love of God, the power of God, the ability of God to transform lives, to transform situations, to bring hope and deliverance and peace where in the world there's no way those things would occur. And until we can live this way, we're a powerless church. We're a powerless Christian. When in reality, we have the greatest power. The greatest love, the greatest goodness the world can ever know is ours. We might not see it right away, but I believe that God wants it for all of us. But we can all walk around the testimony and says, you're not going to believe what God did in my life. This is nuts. God did this. God did that. 
even in my time of, of most longing or hurting, God showed up, and, and my reality is different now. May he be glorified in your lives as you look for and trust him to be all that he promises. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, to um, encounter you is to know you. To see you at work in the miraculous. To see you at work in the things we don't expect. It's to begin to understand your power, your authority, your goodness in our lives. And Lord, let us be a people that expect you to do and say and be all that you promise. And I pray, Lord, for each of us, because each of us come here today with different needs, different longings. Lord God, let us surrender those things to you and receive what you have for us. Thank you that you are a God that is exceedingly good, from whom nothing bad comes. And Lord, even in the, in the trials of life, we know those things don't come from you, yet you meet us in them, and you can use even those things for our good. So let us be a people that have a right perspective when it comes to you, to your power, to your love, to your goodness. And let us, Lord, all move towards you. This Christmas, may you be greatest gift that we receive and experience. May your favor and your presence rest upon us today as we go out, Lord. Let us be a people that are changed because we know you and we hold you in our hearts. I pray, Lord God, for a, a sanctuary full of testimonies to your goodness, to your power, to your love that overcomes all things even the things we cannot understand. We love you, Lord, and we pray have your way in our lives for your glory, for our relationship with you. That your purposes may come to pass, that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven through us. name we pray these things. Amen. Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. And thank you.